Okay, everybody, it's uh, Ink and Echo, and uh, we got a uh, real exciting show for you. We got uh, some very special guests and with uh, uh, Steve Martin and uh, Carol Burnett and the musical stylings of uh, Elton John. Yeah! <laughs> what was that? Did you see my video? No. My Skype video didn't turn on? I'm not looking at my computer. It's turned off. Andy. Okay, listen, everyone. I got to just set this up. I got a guest on a couch behind me. I'm not gonna <laughs> have him look at the back of my head. I I just assumed you had your uh, Skype pulled up. So no, here's... <laughs> I'm trying to save bandwidth, dude. Don't turn your video on. No, I normally don't. But you should turn it on for a second. Oh, I gotta. So that our... I gotta unlock so... my computer. Do the. It's a great intro already. Don't talk yet, Alex. Oh, so you, you got the Kermit the Frog. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I uh, did the whole thing, guys. You were supposed to see it. but uh... <laughs> So for our listeners at home, yes. uh, <laughs> I, d- see, now it's just killed because I have to set it up. Well, this is a but podcast. What did you... <laughs> this is audio. You, the, the idea was you, <laughs> you guys would see Kermit and laugh... Oh. So everybody, we're on a Skype call, and I, as Andy hit record, I I turned on my video, and in their view, it was just a Kermit. No, puppet. and I, as I hit record, I turned off my monitor. <sighs> so I didn't, and plus, I turned away from my computer. Off to a great start. This is sort of like a comedy set that I thought would go great, and oh. I'm bombing. Yeah, well, you we all have some of those. I'm gonna turn my screen off again. You, you want me to see anything? Nope, that's, that's all. all right. That's all, Andy. I wanted to. It's real great. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, our friend Alex is here on my couch. Hey. Hello. Hey, Alex. Hey. Thank you for. So, you're our second guest, and we're just experimenting. You're going to just be on the whole show. <clears throat> nice. Because we can Good. do whatever we want. Right, right. I like it. Um, but hey, before we do anything, Josh, uh, I have a little what? bit of a bone to pick with you. What? Okay. I'm ready for it. <laughs> okay. At, towards the end of the last episode, you threw me under the bus a little bit. <laughs> no, no, no. Listen to me. This is, seri- I, this is serious. I'm listening. I'm listening. All right. You brought up top two topics that I didn't ever really want to discuss on this podcast. And you're forcing me to do this right now. And that's what I'm going to do. You brought up gear culture and you brought up worship culture. And those are two things that I do not want to talk about basically at all, but I'm going to do it now because you brought it up and you threw me under the bus. <laughs> okay. I, it was a joke. It was a good joke. But listen, one of the things you said in there was that uh, the best thing to deal with that stuff is to just get it out in the open and talk about it. But here's what I've been trying to do over the past few years is to passively change the culture of what I do by not referencing certain things. Does that make sense? Mm, this sure. is sounding coming across more serious than I wanted it to sound. It's not that serious, but here, here's what I want to say. So after that episode, I had that same anxiety again, because I was like, I just told, talked about a thing that I am scared about people hearing mm. and I didn't even talk about it that much. But I think the reason why, and I know the reason why, is, okay, there's a culture of people who follow me because they only like guitar pedals. There's a culture of people who follow me because they play guitar in church, and I have a very hard time with both those groups of people. The reason being is that I'm completely scared of them because I see them, correctly or not, as making up a large part of my fan base, and if I say things that offend them, I also see those people as uh, the type of groups that don't really have a lot of room for uh, other opinions and or have assumptions they want to make about me as an artist. And if I change those, my mind on a thing or change my opinion or preferences on things, then then those guys are out of here. And my mind goes to where, well, uh, all these people are gone because of a thing I said and then I can't get money for my music and then I can't feed my family anymore Hmm. so i don't want to have those i don't really want to have this stuff come up much on the podcast because i feel like the idea of creativity and art is vaster than either of those topics and there are far more interesting things to talk about but i wanted to mention my anxiety about it and 
the fact that it's not that I'm like mad at those people. It's the fact that I'm scared of them. <laughs> hmm. So, and the fact that I'm, I'm trying to be passive about it and just not engage in certain things. Sorry, Josh. <laughs> no, that's good. I'm glad you said that. And in the moment, uh, you handled it fine. Like you took it like a joke. Yeah. My mind which, kind which of exploded for a second. Though. I was like, no, <laughs> Well, I hoped it. I hope it was presented no, it in was. the heart of just like I don't know. No, obviously, was, you were not, fine. You were okay, totally okay. fine. Right, I just right, right. I feel like I need to. I also I just want to qualify myself and be like I'm not against anybody really. I'm just like there are certain things that really scare me for some reason. And that's mm-hmm. one of them. Yeah. So there, I got it. Had to say that. I don't want to talk about it anymore ever. Okay, good. Get that out of the way. Sorry, listeners. That was like Andy and I meeting for coffee no, privately, but you got to hear it. <laughs> that's me coming to you solemnly over a latte at Starbucks saying, Josh, mm. what you said last week really was hard for me. Well, Andy, thank you for saying that. Uh, are you serious? I, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Sorry, that sounded like the start of a joke. Uh, I do want to this week throw you under the bus again, uh, if I can. Yes. About something else. Oh gosh. If you're Is done it, with that. No, it's I mean, not one of your sensitive things. It's probably. No, it's going to be you, something I said on Twitter, right? No. Okay. No. Why don't you just listen? <laughs> um. So I love that Alex is just sitting here I'm staring just, at me. I'm just waiting for my pocket. I'm waiting for my moment to step in. <laughs> you can step <laughs> in whenever. I know. I just I I like hearing okay. you guys banter a little bit okay. first. Thanks. Andy, back in our college days, back Whoa. as in when you were going to college and I bummed around with you, uh-huh. uh huh, because I didn't go to college. Um, I would occasionally, as you know, spend the night at your parents' house when you were still living with them. Uh huh. And so something reminded me of this the other day. And I was like, that needs to be mentioned on the show. Okay. So there was this morning where got up, having a good time, Saturday morning, and I feel a little gross, so ask if I can take a shower. Uh-huh. And so go into the bathroom and see uh, towels on the rack, uh-huh. hanging up, towels like thrown over the shower, kind of lurk in the cabinets, and there doesn't seem to be any clean folded ones. Uh-huh. And so I come out of the bathroom still clothed, and I'm like, uh, hey... Andrew, my friend, <laughs> are there any are there any clean towels that I can use? And you said, can't you just use the ones hanging up? <laughs> and I said, haven't those been used by your family? <laughs> and you were like, yeah, is that a problem? <laughs> Dang. I don't remember this at and, all. And I said, yes, it's a problem. Like, yeah, I'll just go ahead and use these towels that have been rubbed on your family's armpits and buttholes and like use it on myself after I'm clean. Wow. But in the moment, in the moment, you had no qualms about letting me use a dirty towel. So can I say, can I say two things? I have two things to say about this. Please go ahead. Uh, For one, that is awful, Andy. As someone who's... (laughs) Wow. (laughs) That is so gross but okay but josh my bigger bone to pick here is with you are you are you a cabinet lurker (laughs) do you open people's bathroom cabinets uh Uh, well i read i read a study like maybe two years ago (laughs) and it said something insane like 80 percent of people would say that they've opened cabinets in a stranger's bathroom so what were you really doing josh I mean, always looking for prescription drugs. And <laughs> right. I just see if I can slip a few into my jeans. <laughs> well, and this it, this was a case of need. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's sort of like in general. I would say now, as an adult, I don't do that. Um, but it's also like, what if you're at somebody's house and <laughs> there's no toilet paper? Mm-hmm. And it, I mean, even uh, pooping at someone else's house is the worst <laughs> anyway. And let's mo- <laughs> let's move away from that as quick as possible. But yeah. um, anyway. So all the, the the moral of the story is, folks, that Andy's been domesticated now by getting married and uh, his wife would never let him give me a nasty towel. Which you've spent the night at my current house in my current situation. You've had fresh towels, correct? Uh, I mean, you just kind of sent the dog in there and told me to kind of rub <laughs> myself off on the dog's fur. Yeah, that's what we do here. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's sort of a step up. <laughs> 
I, I you've been thinking about this for years. Has this been this has uh, been stewing inside of you? I just think it's a funny thing that happened. Huh. That uh, I'm, I'm just reminded of all <laughs> kinds of little gems. And you'll continue to hear about them right here on Ink and Echo. I, I, do I have to start coming up with gems from the other side? If you've got any. I, don't, I won't do it now. It could be a new segment. Yeah. Um, How can we fuck each other <laughs> over? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Andy, edit that out and, and no. put in that I said, um, <laughs> screw each other over. Okay, I will do that. Do you guys edit the show? How edited is the show that we a that little people will hear a little just bit, a little. I just there was there was no. I said go ahead. I know, I know. I was being an ass. Uh, no, I just listened for long pauses, like what just happened. Which now mm-hmm. I have to leave that long pause in because we're referencing it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there, Alex, on the second episode, I absolutely could not read the ad straight i was cracking up like an idiot and andy even got upset with me and it was very hurtful but (laughs) (laughs) but but yeah so uh there was like four takes probably seven minutes worth of material and you had to i had to turn off my mic for a little bit of it too just to see if that could help you keep it together (laughs) yeah um i think we're off to a really good start (laughs) I think you're right. (laughs) Andy, I was curious related to Twitter. This is not a throw you under the bus. This Uh, is just me being me being your dear friend, Uh doctor. Okay. Um, So your series of tweets recently about horror movies and about mortality, which no one actually was. Hey, that's how I feel it with every tweet. The millennials (laughs) didn't respond to my tweets. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thought because that was wait, a wait, rare wait. moment. You can't just say hey. your tweet was interesting and not. Well, I'm pulling. I'm pulling these up. Oh, okay. I, I don't know what you're talking about. So. Uh yeah, I don't have them prepared. Alex in is doing our job right now. But Let's the. See. Well, yeah, Alex can read them straight. Um, straight. Through. How how but long ago? Four of them. It was yesterday. It was a rare moment of Andy. Yeah, it was rare. Being pretty. Uh, Thoughtful. Like saying something real <laughs> on. Does it start on with "I'm fascinated"? I'm fascinated with whatever draws people yes. toward horror movies. Yes. Tweet number one. Tweet number two says, part of it for me is dealing with the ever-growing realization of mortality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> part of it is the ever-increasing desire to see human beings as utterly helpless and weak in the face of something insanely powerful. And the last part being that I really like seeing humanity lose. <laughs> humanity lose. Yeah. Sorry I like horror movies and beer so much. It's, no, that's not part of it. It's hashtag <laughs> unrelatable content. <laughs> that was a couple hours later when no one responded to my tweets. So I said, sorry, everybody. Oh, and then you want to go even farther. What's the next tweet after that? Oh, it went That was away. me being a little upset uh, later. It's you like responding to people. Oh, I built a following based on things I'm no longer interested in. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that relates back to your earlier comment yeah, a little bit. It does. It was just funny to me because I built up a Twitter following on things that, on a personality that I'm like no longer anymore on the internet. So when I try to like say stuff like that, it's just like crickets. But anyway, what, what were you gonna say? You have something pithy to add to that, senior pithy. gains, doctor? That's a good word. Isn't I it? just, I just think it's interesting. Um, oh. I don't know if I had any specific point. I, in particular, and I'm curious if you after having a child thought about mortality Mm. quite a bit more Um. and even had a moment, I don't know if I've ever shared this with anyone, but the, the second, like the 30 seconds after Olive was born and holding her in my arms, there was like a kind of one of those, uh, flash before my eyes moments of like, Oh my gosh, this is, this is a person and someday she's going to be an old woman. (laughs) And what did I do bringing a person into the world? This is really bad. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I I know it was a very existential like terror. Um, and it went away really fast, but it it is just like, Oh shit, this is big. (laughs) You know, obviously I didn't bring the life in, but in a way, you know well what's in, what's interesting for my situation is it's similar but opposite in the sense that Megan had complications th- th- basically every time 
but it was kind of yeah. out of hand three out of four times where she like hemorrhaged unreal and yeah. was like you know I, so i was thinking not about the baby i was thinking about her i was like my wife could die right now <laughs> so it's like the same feeling but for the other person but i don't know i just thought it was fascinating yeah. like why why is there a draw to horror movies it's it's dark and about death and but in but in such a like visceral like not about like not not in a way i mean lots of movies are about death in certain ways but it's just to do it in such a violent gory way like what why do we have a draw to that i was just hmm. thinking about it i don't really know that was my attempt at answering for myself right um i think there is something oddly comforting about it yeah um either seeing things that are so outlandish and over the top that they couldn't ever possibly happen in real life but also uh i guess it de- depends on the type of horror movie but yeah. also uh, there, there's just something um it's almost like we have to make fun of it a little bit to yeah deal with it yeah totally hmm. even not to say that horror movies are all comedy or something obviously right. they're not right. uh when I was even thinking in general, I like supernatural horror movies more than just like slasher films. Cause when it's like mm-hmm. human versus human, that's like not that interesting to me that, I mean, there are certain movies that are that, but like nightmare on Elm street or something where it's just like this, you know, the, the idea of going to sleep and, uh, him, Freddy Krueger getting you in your dreams where you can't get out of it like that. The otherworldly part of it is usually what is m- more interesting are you guys horror movie uh fans well i've only started liking it in the past couple years like a lot and and can you give me some can you give me some uh, films that you've liked that are horror i mean i and we we just said not comedy but i really like the evil dead 2 okay (laughs) which is the iconic bruce campbell sure cuts his arm off and gets a chainsaw on right 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 um I really, I only saw The Exorcist for the first time this year. I really liked it. Okay, um, I'm trying to think. Josh, are you a horror movie no. guy? Yeah, I, I'd say uh, more recently, like Andy as well. Maybe a little bit before Andy, because I started recommending some things if I remember right early on. Yeah, totally. Um, but I'm still, I'm no connoisseur at all, and I'm also kind of picky. Um, but yeah, I do enjoy it a lot. I would say The Thing is one of my oh, favorites. Yeah. John mm-hmm. Carpenter. Mm-hmm. Um, Wait, Alex, what do you think? Do you have a thought? Do you not? You see, I, your face says no. I like literally him. don't have a thought. I, <laughs> I, um, when it comes to the horror genre, I've never been super yeah. interested in uh-huh. it. Um, I think I like the the idea of it because it's like a thrill ride more yeah. than anything um yeah. but i i think you can get the same feeling out of just a really good suspense sure. or like something so I, i'm not really drawn to horror yeah. movies personally interesting yeah i don't know it just seemed like overall we thinking about humanity we shouldn't maybe be drawn to that kind of stuff but we are for some reason i don't know it's just interesting it's a way of dealing with the reality of what's to come <sighs> It's sort of, I think it is honestly along the same lines of, and this is not something I like, but comedy that is so um, inappropriate, Mm -hmm. I guess, stand-up comics, not necessarily vulgar, but joking about uh, cancer or dead babies or like horrific things that do happen um, or, you know, mentally retarded people or something. And these comedians who just dive right in and they make these very real tragic things hilarious because we're all just like, Oh, that's bad, but yeah, that's kind of true. Well, uh, I could, I sort of want to defend that a little bit, but I don't know if I can. Well, because I just watched uh, Louis, Louis Louis C.K.'s new stand up on Netflix. Okay. And there's a part where um, he's doing that, you know, he's talking about someone's got a baby on the plane. And you know, so he's holding a baby, and then the baby's crying, and like the dude in front of him turns around and just stares at him, like, you going to do something about that? And then. <laughs> He took the mic and just like sadly pretended it was the baby and just like wringing its neck and then presented it to the man in the seat in front of him. was like, is this what you wanted? (laughs) Which is exactly what you're talking about, right? Uh, 
Yeah, and see, even that description, it's like, okay, no, I wouldn't have. Well, yeah, I, that. right. It just sounds sad and weird. I know. I'm. I love Louis C.K. I think he's freaking hilarious. Yeah, but, but without the watching him do it, yeah, it I'm makes not, it a whole other. Thing. I'm not him. So <laughs> right. that wasn't a good <laughs> right. rendition but of me <laughs> staring at Andy <laughs> yeah. wringing out a hypothetical <laughs> baby's neck is pretty terrifying. Oh, what are we he's... doing today on this podcast? <laughs> well, it just. All, all I was trying to say is that comedy, similarly to horror, is a way of dealing with a real. Yeah. Well, and element. the other interesting thing is, I listen to a lot of. It seems like a lot of comedians have good podcasts, and talking, hearing comedians talk, and people do comedic movies. It seems like uh, horror movies and comedies are like the hardest kind of movies to do well. Hmm. Like they're more bad comedies and horrors than than good ones and it but and as opposed to like a i don't know what else a drama or fantasy or something they have like a higher percentage rate of like this is actually good hmm. so i think there's something to be said about those types of movies are probably harder to make and do well i think just from hearing people talk about doing them i don't know yeah i think that's true i am so ready for a word from our sponsor are you i am i am okay. is it time yeah it's, it's already time, time. Okay. Yep, here we go. <laughs> Andy, everybody knows that we here at Inconeco record uh, from aboard our own respective sea vessels. I mean, everybody knows we, <laughs> like many other podcasters, we found the best place to record is actually out in the middle of water on a boat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's relaxing out there on the waves. It's peaceful. Uh-huh. It's great to just be out uh, after a long day of semi truck driving and <laughs> relax a little. And uh, but I was thinking, isn't it frustrating that there isn't or that there used to be uh, no resources for podcasters at sea? Mm. It's you know, yeah, huge problem. It was a huge gap in the market there. Well, yeah. Now there is. Uh, we're sponsored today by Pondcast Express. The best and only service for podcasters who like to record live from the center of a body of water. And so uh, Podcast Express has got all sorts of exciting products and services catered to us, uh, such as rubber galoshes for stomping leeches. Uh, they've got waterproof iPad cases. They uh-huh. have self-leveling microphones for tumultuous uh-huh. waters. Um, Interesting. They have these hammers that are especially for whacking beavers. And they'll just kill them in one hit and they kind of tumble over the side. Um, and there's, they've got water people repellent for those sort of like web, uh, yeah. web foot and web hand. Creature yeah, it of the sucks Black to have Lagoon. to restart a sh- podcast because of a water person. Yeah, because they only live off of pop filters. Like they just come up and oh. eat them and then jump back in the water and you're See, like, See, that's oh. information I didn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> And you have to have a stockpile or you're out 89 cents every time. Um, Jeez. So, well, this is already so informational. and There's already something I could take away from this. Hold it's on, great. Andy. There's okay. more. They have more to offer you. Okay. Pond, Pondcast Express has a whole online library of authentic wildlife sounds. Uh, so they've got platypus tail slaps. Uh, there's some <laughs> moose groans. There's some wolf howls, locusts chirping. That's a popular one. Mm. And there's a wide variety of chupacabra roars. Okay. Um, that's for those people who record from a pond, but they might not have the luxury of a real animal life nearby. You know? Yeah. We uh-huh. want them to feel authentic, too. Mm. Lastly, this is, this is pretty exciting. They've got uh, flavored tablets for those who are stranded at sea. So this uh-huh. is if you're maybe your boat crashes while you're podcasting and uh you know you're just yeah. holding on to like a plank and you have to drink the salt water uh-huh. um so these tablets you actually throw them in the water and the salt water isn't going to hydrate you it's actually still going to kill you and you'll die out there <laughs> because it can't hydrate you but it'll make the water taste better um, okay and so some of their tablet flavors include uh strawberry <laughs> kiwi explosion uh triple berry palooza and uh begging for bacon ah sounds like a tasty way to die yeah i mean go down in style (laughs) now i ordered my personalized boat oars from pondcast express and they're laser engraved with my initials and you can also put custom phrases on them so i 
<laughs> I did some uh, boat puns. So one of them okay. says, "One of them says, yeah, buoy," <laughs> and, <laughs> and the other one says, "Peers to you." <laughs> See, it's and uh, and my friends who come on the boat, they're just like Josh. You're you're so clever and adorable. So our friends at Podcast <laughs> Express are offering a one month free trial exclusively to our our listeners with the offer code. All libertarians are actually Satanists. So just visit uh, inkandecho.com slash pondcast. Okay. <sighs> All right. That was amazing. I'm excited to have those guys Is there on board. some sort of discount code? How do I... Uh, is there something special I can get? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Will the the one month free free trial? Ah, uh, uh, with with our with offer the code. discount code. Okay, yeah. Great. yeah, I'm gonna check that out at Ink and Echo slash podcast <laughs> podcast. Andy, yeah. we've got our we've got our second guest ever today. I don't. I was gonna say our second guest ever has a podcast now, so that was probably super useful to you. Have you ever thought about podcasting from, you know, the middle of the large lakes we hear, right, have I, here in New Mexico? Right. <laughs> I have, yeah, because we have a lot of them here. No, no, that's that's definitely how I prefer to do them. Yeah, it's how a lot of people prefer to, and you know, it's cool that it's getting easier to do. Anyway, yes, Alex Sugg is here. Uh, Alexander J. J. Sugg, Sugg. Or Shug, if you're nasty. feeling... <laughs> no. If you're feeling... If you're feeling know. smooth. <laughs> yeah, I'm so here, Alex, and I'm happy to be here. Alex, uh, for my benefit and for that of our listeners, mine, since I haven't talked to you in a long time, what exactly are you doing these days? Um, so maybe just what the heck do you do? What you've got going well, on? Why are you here in my room? <laughs> right? Yeah, how'd you uh, get there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. My name's Alex. I write music for film and commercials and different types of media. I do that. Um, I'm recently married. Got married a few Woo. months ago. I know. It's sweet. Um, so I got married. Uh, and I'm starting a new podcast that's launching t- tomorrow. Say, I, I don't know when your pot does it say it launched on Friday. It launched on Friday. This past this Friday. Pr- this past Friday. <laughs> so it's coming out tomorrow. We're recording this on the Thursday. And I think these come out, what, on Mondays? Mo- Mondays? Okay. Yeah. So my podcast will be out when you hear this. It's called Open, Open Air. Air. Open Air. And it's kind of an interview style show. So, Oh, yes, kind of like in Kaneko? No, it's not <laughs> associated. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I know. Uh, no, it's not associated with NPR. Uh, it is, actually. Oh. Ira Glass is my co-host. Amazing. Can you do an Ira Glass impression, Josh? I feel like you could try. Act one, <laughs> the loneliest whale in the sea. The Dude, 52 I kn- hertz whale <laughs> swims around at the lowest portions of the uh, ocean and it has no. <laughs> that really doesn't sound like you. No, it's, it's just, no. It's just, I just like the affect. Act one. Act one. Yeah, that's all you have to say. <laughs> yeah. You could have stopped there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's me. That's what I do. I feel sort of bad because you've been planning your podcast for quite a while. And like really thinking it through and being thoughtful. And, <laughs> right. and then we kind of jump in. We were just like, well, we're going to start now. We're just kind of flying by the seat of our pants. I love, I love it. They're really different. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're really different. Mine's like, I've interviewed filmmakers today. I interviewed a filmmaker. I've interviewed like startup founders. Yeah. and. Well, I was going to ask, because I you sent me the episode I did with you. Mm-hmm. And I listened today to the one you did with Levi. Um and it seems like, are you, how, like, how are you putting yourself personally into it? It seems like you are not, other than what might come up in the interview with the other person, you're not really right. putting your own life into it. Is that a fair yes, assessment? Yes, that is fair. It's more, yeah, I've kind of used it as a a cool way to meet people who yeah. I really want to meet. And it's it's been really fun, honestly, and I feel kind of bad for the listeners, but the most rewarding parts of the show have been like the conversations that are happening off the air yeah. with these mm-hmm. people. So uh-huh. once I hit stop on record, I'll get an extra 30 you minutes. You get like of, a debrief. Yeah. Or, and then we'll, you know, 
almost become more like friendly rather yeah. than like formal interview style, which has been really cool. So um, what, what type of people have you interviewed and do you want to interview? So I've done, let's see, as of today, I've interviewed five people okay. and the first two were, you were my first interview. Huh. And so your, your episode, it's not the first that's coming out. It'll be in a hmm. few weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I interviewed Levi, Levi McAllister, AKA Levi, the poet. Uh huh. Um, today I interviewed Solomon Ligthelm, who's a filmmaker. Oh, the music bed guy. Yes. He's on, or he's on a music bed. Yeah. So he's a filmmaker. I interviewed him today. Um, and he'll be on next, I'll release his episode next week or Actually, if this is coming out on Monday, it'll be out tomorrow. Uh, oh, cool. um, so, and then a guy named Clayton Dowd, who started a company called O'Dowds. It's like an apothecary. They do cool. men's grooming supplies. And then a guy named Luke Beard um, is the fifth. And he founded a, a startup called Exposure. And it's hmm. like a photo-based um, site where you can post your photos and... Um, yeah, it's like a social media for photo. That's cool. You've had more... I mean, you definitely have creative things you do absolutely need to do them well but you've even more than me i think uh have a very large bent toward businessy things sure so i mean i mean like our our thing here is we want to talk about creative process and stuff which it seems like it's the same for you but it's probably is it a little broader in the sense that you want to talk to like people who are doing startups and right like well, how, I, what's I the like... what's the like how, the criteria the type of person you right, want. Yeah. Right. The criteria is I have to admire them as uh-huh. a per, from a personal standpoint. Like it has to be someone who I see and admire. And so it's someone like, you know, a Solomon Ligthelm is like yeah. a personal hero who I love his work as a video yeah. maker guy. Um, so I, yeah, so it has to be that. And, um, and I, and they have to be doing something innovative. And I feel yeah. like if they're doing, um, whatever creative field they're in, it's not like a certain creative field I'm going for. It's kind of anything goes. Yeah. As long as they're doing it well. And as long as I am into what they're doing, I feel like I can tease out things that anyone who's creative can kind of put in their back pocket and use for their, cause that's what I've always, I mean, I listen to so many podcasts that are like meant for designers, like specifically, but I use that stuff for my music work. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted to make a show that's more like driven towards just creative people as Mm -hmm. a whole. And so just anyone who's creative can like learn something from someone who might be uh, doing something different than them. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's, it's pretty broad. And I wanted it to be like that. I feel like I'd b- get pretty bored if it were, you know, I was just interviewing composers or just photographers. Well, or you'd, just you'd run out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty quick you'd run out. So Yeah. Cool. And Alex, what would you say is your favorite Abraham the Poor song? <laughs> I'm just Abraham kidding. Don't answer. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I am, no, I am thinking. I'm no. thinking. So... The, does anyone no. even know what Abraham? I haven't heard you I mention hope that on not. the show. Hey, Abraham the that Poor. Wasn't a real I haven't question. heard that name in years. That was Abraham the Poor was Josh Josh's band from a while ago, and ages when, ago. Yeah, and Josh used to live in Albuquerque, and so I played in his band. Me and Andy both, I think. Yeah, Andy yep. played. In you it recorded. I didn't record, but we both played. Yeah, yeah you did. So you, you did some guitar on a couple tracks. Oh right. Um, You're right. So I played drums for Josh for I don't know what couple of years off yeah. and on. Yeah, yeah, a couple of years. Um, and I, I was going to mention a serious thing, uh, just that as, for as long as I've known you, you've been very proactive. Yeah. And I, I'd say like a very disciplined, hard worker, and it, it just seems like you've always had something going on ever since Brailleist mm. days, um, and and then into Nose Whistler and into glow house and um i just is that a like a compulsion do you uh kind of feel not like yourself if you're not working on something or? oh man that means a lot that you said that i've been feeling like lately like i've been uh dragging a little bit but yeah i mean i i feel like that's just part of my personality um i think i i was kind of like you josh where i just didn't go to college i just wanted to do other things and I guess I feel like an kind of like a natural, it sounds stupid. I hate saying this, but it is genuinely how I feel like kind of an outsider in a lot of ways. Um, Like I was in high school and I had like a core group of buddies, but we weren't like 
cool at school. You know what I mean? We like definitely mm-hmm. stuck to ourselves and we're into weird art and weird music and all kinds of stuff like that. And I don't know, I guess I've always just been um, pretty driven to like make cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that's just kind of inherently in my, in my DNA as a person. Um, sometimes I don't execute nearly as often as I would like, but I, I do think it's just part of my personality to always be thinking of what I want to do next and what's the next thing for me and, um, yeah, how to make yeah. something cool. So I, I do think that's a big part of who I am as a, as a, just a person. Yeah. And in the, in the in-between times, like, do you beat yourself up about it or have you had lulls in creativity where you just feel blank and empty and like you can't come up with anything? Yes, definitely. I feel like there have been, um, yeah, definitely seasons of like, especially after, um, you know, you you go through highs and lows. I'm sure you've, all three of us have experienced that, you know, after like a release or something when you, when you put out an album and, you know, a lot of people like it or you, um, you know, for a while I had a company where we're doing videos, like a kind of like a branding consulting video company where we were making videos for local businesses and people really liked that. Um, and then it kind of went away, it dissolved. And, um, when you're not making stuff and, and have a huge output of like, uh, creative work, I feel, or at least for me, I feel like that's when I'm at my, um, most like down and out. Yeah. Like I feel like part of who I am is just, I have to be making stuff all the time. And if I'm not, then I kind of feel like I'm not, uh, being who I was meant to be on this Mm -hmm. planet, you know? So I definitely, it ebbs and flows. Like right now I feel like I'm kind of on a mountaintop because this, um, podcast is going really well and I'm excited about how it is. And that's kind of the thing I've been focusing on and music has been really solid, but there've definitely been plenty of seasons where I'm like, you know, wondering if, (laughs) if I'm ever going to make anything again or if, if, uh, anything I'm going to make is going to be good again or, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So I think it's just part of the process, but I've also tried learning like that it's important to soak in those seasons in like inspiration rather than output. (laughs) Um, I feel like a huge part of, um, being creative and being productive in your creativity is like having positive inspiration during those times of like less output. So I've learned that when I'm feeling less creative or when I'm not working as hard on personal projects or whatever it is, I try and like watch more movies or listen to more albums or listen to more podcasts and take notes and really become inspired by, um, other things during that season. And I feel like it kind of stacks up for me. So when I do start working on something new, I feel like I kind of have a a stockpile of creativity and inspiration to draw from. So would you say that you never really have to like, I mean, for, Overall, do you wait for something to hit you that you want to do? Or is there ever times where you're like, well, I've been sitting here watching movies, listening for albums, listening to albums, and nothing's coming, so I'm just going to try to force something. Like, Do you feel like you ever have to force it or no? Yeah. Yeah, I think... um, Yeah, and I think this is kind of where my business mind comes in, like you said earlier, Andy. I think a lot of what... uh, You get good at something by doing something a lot. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to like music especially... Um, you know, like I played music under the name glow house. I've, I've done that for years and years now. And I still am wondering whether or not I'll do another album under that name, (laughs) but I do keep writing music for it. And I, I feel like I always am writing for it. And I have, I remember you told me a while, maybe like a year ago or so that you just have like this bank of musical ideas, like probably (laughs) hundreds yeah, I, I which yeah, that is not how I work at all. Like basically, the only th- musical ideas I've ever written are the ones I've released. Right. But I'm always jealous of people who they're like, yeah, we had 60 songs for our album, we had to pare it down to 12. <laughs> right. I'm just like, what? Like how? Right. I, that's not how I work at all. I wish I had 60 like completed songs, well, but they're yeah. they're more like, and yeah. maybe that's what they mean. Like we just sure. had 60 ideas and sure. fleshed out whatever you know and i write music for other stuff that's not just glow house i write it for obviously film and like levi i write for him as well and um so yeah i just write if i feel like it but i'll I'll crank out at least two or three ideas a week at a minimum just to keep that muscle 
a little bit because I I have gone through times where I won't write anything for a month or so. And then I just feel like stupid when I get back. Right, (laughs) Right, exactly. It's like basketball. You lose your shot unless you keep shooting all the time. Right. And I was listening to the intro of your podcast and the new episode. Did you do all the music that's underneath? Yeah. So that's that's cool. It sounded really good. Thanks. Yeah. So that's another cool part of the podcast is I'm doing a, a unique song for every episode. Oh. So <clears throat> which will later be available for like streaming and licensing and that's all that awesome. stuff. So, so you're gonna have at least one new song every week. Right. That's so, so cool. that's another cool um little discipline I made for myself in the yeah. in making the podcast. And it was kind of a it's kind of a cool project just on a personal level. Like it's it's a lot more personal than I think it comes out in the interviews. Like hmm. it is a definitely a disciplinary thing for me to get good at like being consistent too. Yeah. Um, and it really gives you the, when you're scheduling interviews with people, especially people who are like crazy busy and stuff, you have to be accountable, you know, and you have to be accountable on when you release your show. Mm -hmm. And I now have to be accountable to write a new song every week. Uh All the stuff that, um, if you just don't make, uh, you know, if you don't put it on your calendar, if you don't make it a definite thing, you just won't do, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's let's to talk about us for a second. Jeez, uh, no, I just that's the one thing I like about this podcast too is we we didn't really prepare much before going into it, but the stuff I did prepare is like I'm gonna try to set up some technical things so that I have to do minimal editing hmm. after this, and then we just whatever we say here, throw it up, and then it's like so it's not actually that much work. It's the right. consistency that's kind of more interesting to me, right. and I know that we're going to get better at it over sure. time. So I don't have, I'm trying not to put any pressure on what we're doing here, but it seems like you've, like I said it before, but it seems like you've put a lot of thought into the tone of even how you're talking in the intro and outro and like how you are talking to people. Like you've already got some of that consistency, which is cool. right. Yeah. I just, I wanted it. I think that's something else I've obsessed over for a long time. I think it, it came to me when I was in like local bands in high school and stuff. And I, I mean, I used to play shows with Josh in other bands, like Josh and I was bands playing together all through when I was in high school. Did you ever play with me? I don't know what band you're in. <laughs> were you, were you, I don't know. Do you make music? Or, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. Were you in another band though? No, I, I think you were, but no, well, no, I did a lowercase noises show and I had a drummer Oh, Andy, that was me. That that was me drumming at that show. No, I'm a really great drummer. It's one of my other skills. No, your brother played guitar for me. Sorry, not your brother. Jeez, that was a stupid thing to say. Caleb Davis's brother played. (laughs) Caleb Davis's brother. Josh Josh played guitar for (laughs) me. No, I I was trying to... Whatever, this is stupid. But I swear... I must have been there because Josh was in my band. <laughs> so we Yeah, you guys played after me. Yeah. That, so it was, must have been you. Yeah. Why well, can't neither of us remember it? Yeah. So it was just once, I guess. But sorry, I derailed that, that whole Alex. thing. Yeah, sorry. Um something I've really obsessed over and I think it it came from failures of doing this in high school that really rubbed me the wrong way of like when I was going to release an album or when we were as a band it was always super like haphazardly and it was um not well uh executed and we didn't plan very well for it and it was just kind of like let's just throw it out there type thing yeah. and just see what happens and yeah and i just quickly learned that like especially in music and in anything creative nowadays um i mean i guess you can just throw throw stuff out there but i wanted to make my stuff always kind of stand out by yeah. showing that it was really f- planned out and that yeah um like especially in the local music scene i wanted to stand out as like wow like this is actually um more than just like a local band or um and you just work hard too right like the, the local band who puts out a cd there's many things you could point to and be like well they didn't work hard on that <laughs> right. they didn't really work hard on that sure so if if yeah if you can just work hard on sure m- the majority of what goes into a project right. you're automatically going to be just standing out <laughs> right and with the podcast thing too it's super um i feel like with music you can hide more like behind abstraction hide like, like yourself yeah yeah absolutely you can hide um even me like singing or, or josh might 
be able to relate to this when he was doing Abraham the Poor. Like you can, I, I mean, I especially feel like I, I do this with music is like hide a little bit of me in the abstraction of my music and mm-hmm. that, that it's like a little bit weird. You can't really understand what I'm talking about. It's very poetic and meaningful to me, but yeah. it's really vulnerable to just come out on a limb and just talk yeah. <laughs> and just, uh-huh. you know, put yourself out there as who you are and <laughs> what you're about. And that's something I was afraid of for a long time. I think that's why I didn't start my show sooner than I did. Um, that's why we didn't start our show. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think, I mean, the more brave I got when I would think about doing it, the more I realized like, okay, I want to do this. I want to yeah. make this show, but I want it to be really good and really thoughtful and, um, and so I kind of approach it the same way as I as I have with my music the past few years. It's just like really thoughtful and and um, yeah, just trying to be really intentional about it. And something that something that I would want to listen to. Yeah, you know? for sure. Uh, Alex, I'm sorry if you said this already. Is and this is kind of a change of subject. Is the composing stuff your full time job now, or do you are you able to sustain just off of that, or do you have a day job as well? You don't have to say what it is, but no. So I do. Well, I, it could sustain me, but I do, it's my primary income. So music is my primary income, but I do work part time in my church as well. Okay. So I do two days there or three days there, uh, 19 hours a week doing video and design and different things like that there. But music is still, um, like the thing that pays the bills for my wife and I. Yeah. So that's uh, sweet. I did not know that. One thing I'd want to ask guess and you can be as vague or as specific as you want but um i I, even just within the music income is there like a a way you could break it down in percentages like more specifically not not necessarily x amount comes from this but it's like (laughs) right you know i I just think it'd be interesting for people to hear sure so i again if you yeah let me break this down real easy for everyone yeah i am not andy and so shut up (laughs) i'm kidding i'm kidding so (laughs) i make i make literally maybe 10 bucks a month from like spotify and apple music and streaming sites where Uh that is not your situation (laughs) at all it's very different but but i make the the majority of my money from music from licensing so just the use of my songs and commercials and film and I mean, I just got hired. I I had a phone call today with a a buddy for um, like an original composition for a commercial about um, this famous old school basketball player. I don't know how much I can say. His name's Kareem. (laughs) That's that's his name. So I get get hired for random commercial spots to do the music for them as well. And then licensing for existing songs that I've already made. So So with music bed... Do you see which every... that's the licensing site for people? Who right. Don't so the, know. the music bed, are, they represent me. So they do all of my licensing for existing songs. And to okay. get even more granular, if you want, you have an exclusive agreement with them, correct? I do. Whereas so, I do not. Right. But I still license through them. Right. So all of my songs, like I've had companies and it's been kind of a bummer a few times, like really big things come uh, my way come my way and um i have to say no to them because it's an exclusive music bed see, and, that, and that's one of the reasons i've held off sure so no it, but it's also helped me out in numerous ways like sure. i i owe music bed everything. sure oh, they, yeah. they've given me my career at all you right. know so what, what were you gonna say josh about that oh i was gonna say do you see every client as it happens or like is there potentially the scenario where your song could pop up and something and you didn't even know it was used but you did get paid for it oh yeah that's that's like the bulk of what it is so basically people can go to music bed um like say for cordial kill if you decide you need an additional song that Andy does not make the right way or something. Andy has which, a nervous breakdown <laughs> and cannot it, fulfill his duties. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can go to Music Bed and, and they just have a huge library of songs. You can license and then basically you pay for it, you choose the license you need for it, and then the artist in this scenario, me, would get a certain uh, percentage and the Music Bed would get a certain percentage. Well, but the, the, I would never see your project if you right. license and it. And the, the brilliance of it, and maybe this had been done before them, Maybe not. I don't know. But it's it's the fact that the person who wants to use the song doesn't actually have to interface with the artist because that's the worst part of the whole process. Right. You know, is trying to contact the artist and be like, hey, can I use your song? Right. Is there a fee? Like, it just removes all that. And and then so it's great from the client's end because they can just, you know, add basically add the song to the cart and 
check out and then they got and their great license. from the artisan because yeah. i mean just on this on this podcast i got a notification i got a song licensed just during this podcast. should i see if i got any and it's uh it's pretty much it's oh, a really cool business model because i didn't get any licenses <laughs> <laughs> it's cool for the artist because you can you know you make a song and then you can make money on it for the yeah, foreseeable future, life you know? yeah so it's it's pretty cool it's a and good did, system did the composing come about more or less because of having done Levi's album? Like, was that the segue that made you realize you could do more of this? Or was it even before that, that you were doing composing work? I think I started venturing into it before that. Um, okay. I, I got hooked up with a music bed. Who hooked you up? Probably like four years ago. Some dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, Andy got me on the music bed. Like, well, cause right. you, I recorded the glow house album and I gave you the instrumentals and I was like, Hey, I, you should, put this on right so <laughs> that was sweet because back then they yeah. had like 50 artists or something yeah, so we were very many. we were one of the first people to get on there but mm-hmm. anyway when i started seeing like wow this actually like works for people right. and then you start seeing some of their big time composers on music that are making like really really great livings just doing yeah. music um i started thinking more about doing that and i've always loved film like really loved film and i've loved soundtracks um for a long, long time. So it was kind of a cool little open door. Like, wow, this is actually an opportunity to, to flex that muscle a little bit, you know? And then when the Levi project came up, I really just tried, um, I didn't have a film to do it with, but I had his poetry and I kind of entered into it with a film composer's mindset. I wish it was actually called the Levi project. (laughs) (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, just the, the correspondence album is what I mean. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I had been working on it for a while, but I feel like that kind of opened the door because that album's done really well with licensing because it's yeah. um, cinematic and um, and I feel like that has kind of opened more doors for me as far as the composing composing world goes. And when you you're different than me too, you've really sought out um, basically work for hire stuff, mm-hmm. and I feel like and maybe it somehow ties into your ability to have hundreds of song snippets available, and I don't. But like I. I have not really done that well hmm. under like work for hire situations. I've done it a few times. I'm actually about to do it again, but with way less pressure. So I'm I'm excited to try it again and see if I can get better at it. Mm-hmm. But you seem to have no problem with it. Like you can because my problem is it's kind of like when in high school you get assigned a book to read, <laughs> and it, like I would love to read this book if no one told me to read it. But right. the fact that someone told me I had to read it. So I'm just like, don't want it. It's not fun. And so as soon as someone tells me and or like pays me like, okay, now you owe me a song. I just kind of like crumple <laughs> sure. a little bit. I'm like, oh, I don't actually want to do this anymore. Sure. Well, maybe it's just the, the competitive nature of me against me or something. Huh. Like I like the challenge. So I like when someone, um, cause the, the music for, ad agencies and commercials and stuff. It's a really weird industry. So yeah. I'll like get an email saying, Hey, we need a song. sounds just like this. And we need it in two hours yep. <laughs> yep. or something crazy. So you have to like, it's been really challenging too to have to like, okay, so there's this crazy song. That's like a jazz thing. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> yeah. for me, it's like, I've never played jazz. I suck at <laughs> piano. Like I yeah. can't do this, but, yeah. but I always say yes because I know huh. that even if they don't choose my song, I got better at playing piano or yeah. I got closer to being able to achieve that. And I, I, I like that. Um, I do like that aspect of the job. I wish it were at better hours of the day because sometimes I'll get like an email at like 5 p.m. saying, hey, oh. we need something in four hours. Yeah, or, they don't respect the business day. They do not. Um, <laughs> so that's the one thing I, I dislike about it, but I do like the the work for hire because I think it pushes me as a writer yeah. and as a musician to just be better. What are some of the biggest placements you've gotten? Mm. Can you? Is that weird? Yeah. So this new one with Kareem is definitely big. That is coming out, I think, in the winter. So oh, okay. I'm still we're still in production for that one. So that one's pretty big. That's going to be like on TV and stuff. And I've gotten one, probably my favorite one is one by Beats by Dre. Nice. That um, was with the, yeah. one of Levi's. Well, Right. So that was one of yeah. the songs I wrote for Levi. And that was for Richard Sherman wearing Beats during the Super Bowl where the Seahawks are playing. So, it was, so cool. it was like a really big, I mean, I think I got a few million views on YouTube, which was exciting for That's me. That's crazy. Um, 
and the visit the m night Shyamalan movie oh yeah um they used one of our songs in their like dvd oh um, interesting which was strange but cool um yeah jet blue new balance universal studios that's so cool uh yeah so those are some of the the bigger ones and then and then just like countless smaller ones too sure a lot of little guys aaron and jessica's wedding aaron and jessica's wedding a lot of those (laughs) that's a lot of what music that is josh (laughs) a lot of wedding licenses you can go in and look at a report on and they can put it in whatever title they want so sometimes it'll (laughs) just be blank and you're like i don't and so it'll just be Sarah and Dave's wedding. Sure. It's just, it's so that's mostly what it is. Another thing about for as long as I've known you, I would say, and I'm not uh, just tooting your horn here or trying to be uh, disingenuine, but it, you have always been a person with depth and I would say even maturity beyond your years. And um, when I first met you, for in fact, for the majority of the time I've known you, you were uh, not a Christian Mm -hmm. and actually pretty heartily opposed to it, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then, you know, you became a believer in Jesus a couple of years back. And I'm just curious, uh, because like your, your music and your work has always had a tendency towards darkness. And even Mm -hmm. though in person you're a very like pretty, uh, not peppy, but you're just, you're very positive. I feel like if you were down in public, people would not necessarily know just because you keep yourself pretty hmm. upbeat. Um, but your music clearly communicates like a, a heaviness and a, a depth of thought and maybe some internal uh, struggle. Sure. And so I'm just curious, um, has anything changed about your process since becoming a believer and I, and I don't even mean moving away from the darkness, but I just mean, cause uh, yeah, I just mean, um, uh, has that had any hmm. effect or difference on your thinking, on your output, on how you view what you do? Yeah, definitely. When it comes to like art, I've always gravitated towards, um, darker stuff. Like, um, if it's, T, like if it's a a movie i would re- way rather watch like david fincher than like i'm gonna edit in a keaton henson song under this section <laughs> okay. right here just to get real sad uh-huh. um yeah like i i definitely gravitate towards like really um darkish art i guess um and i don't really know why i guess it's maybe in my upbringing my brother my older brother was super into like death metal and I, like, I saw my first concert was Yes, which was not death metal. My second concert was a week later, and it was Cattle Decapitation. <laughs> and so I grew how, up. How old were you at that time? Seven. Uh, fourth grade. Oh, so wow. That's pretty, that's pretty gnarly. I just threw out that number. I don't know. It was gnarly. I remember watching the lead singer just spit on himself <laughs> repeatedly. <laughs> he kept spitting into the air and letting it land on himself and... Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was, I don't know. How old are you in fourth grade? Nine, ten, yeah. um, and so that was. I, I grew up with really heavy music, um, and I think I was always kind of drawn to that. And then, like with movies, I just was always drawn to darker stuff too. And I, I don't know why that is, but to answer your question, I feel like when I became a believer, in certain ways, I think I. And I feel like I'm coming full circle now. It's kind of like a journey I'm on now. But I feel like I wanted that stuff to change about me. Like <laughs> I wanted the art that I made to become like more happy or more joyful or more whatever it is that comes. But I just don't think that's who God made me to be necessarily. And I, I don't mm-hmm. think I'd maybe be a sad person. I'm so much happier and full of life and full of joy since I've become a Christian. But I do think... Um, when I express myself through art, it usually comes from a really deep place of like sadness because there's a lot of sad stuff in the world. And I think that still drives my greatest inspiration is like helping sad things um, come to life a little bit. And I think that's always been like, like I'm not, I hate small talk. 
<laughs> so much. Like it's just yeah. not not in me to like want to talk about the weather. I hate that. I would rather. I'd, I'd say I'd say that goes for all parties uh, present. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 And that's, <laughs> I mean that's why we're all yep. friends. I think I love that. But but if I can like get deep and like talk to someone like about their soul, you know, and about the things that yeah. they're insecure about and the things that they um, are afraid of, the things that have hurt them in their life, like. I feel like that's where real change happens. And I guess that's where I like to explore in my art as well. Like being unafraid to explore the darkness so you can come out stronger. Um, yeah, I, I do think that's, and I, I feel like I've come full circle. Like I put out an EP a few years ago when Andy and I went on tour and it was like more happy songs, I guess. Um, may, they might not sound like it to others, but I was for trying, you it was <laughs> for me they were yeah absolutely and they were trying to be more optimistic and very much like there were biblical references and gospel messages and all of it and stuff and it was cool don't get me wrong and a lot of people liked it but I don't think I would do that again because I don't think that was me going to the deepest place of who God made me I think it was me kind of going to who Wait, I so you want. saying you saying you're coming full circle is it fair or unfair to say that as you entered uh the north american institutional church system that it initially was a hindrance to your art yeah okay that's fair mm. uh well yeah i would say that's fair i, I wouldn't say when i i want to tie this into your podcast with levi that i just listened to three hours ago if i can sure just, yeah just because i was hearing you guys go back and forth about kind of wrestling with what art should be right within and i was just i was just kind of in my head i was just like you know what just just do like are we when you're in that system you have these r rules put on you and i just sure. wish no one had them i like i yeah. i hate that someone like you with all this creative ability kind of came into the system and then all of a sudden had these new quote unquote rules or like things sure. to think about with your art when really you should have just kept doing what you were doing and just right. be like art. And you guys said it in the podcast too, that just art is valuable in and of itself. But it's sure. funny because anyone outside of the church is just like, yeah, you know, <laughs> like, right. Totally. I yeah. just think we're and screwing I, ourselves. Totally. I, I agree with that too. And I, and I will say none of that was, I can honestly say none of that was like inflicted by oh, the no. church. I, f I felt like when, because like Josh was saying earlier, I was such a staunch kind of atheist before. And it was a whole, that's a whole other podcast talking about why I became a Christian. That's a whole other thing. But when I did, I felt like um, because it was such a change in my heart and like my belief system, I had to change like kind of everything about me. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think, when I say coming full circle, I'm realizing like, even when I didn't believe like there were, there were things that I still am that I was then that like God made me to be. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still very much who I was and I'm still attracted to the same type of art and creation that I was then. Um, but I agree that um, I'm finally coming to a place where I feel like I, to truly be who I feel like God wants me to be, I have to just be brave and do the thing well, and, and, that's, not, and not let um, what I think, quote unquote, Christianity or Christian critics will think. Well, yeah, and I don't want to dwell here for too long, but I'll just say I think um, not that any, no one's really saying this, but I feel like that's seen as selfish inside the church, hmm. the idea of doing art because it's what you want to hmm. make and hmm. and again no one is saying that explicitly but when all the only people around you are like well uh the song's got to be in this key so the old ladies can sing and it's got to <laughs> say have these kind of imagery and whatever it's just that's that it i hate that so sure. much and you yeah. know I, it's, like i said i don't want to stay here but no, I, just, I know I, I love that i just f feel like art is valuable and even though it might seem selfish, the most valuable art comes from what you want to, to do. Sure. Not what anyone else told you to do. So right. no. And I, yeah. And it's important to me to come back and just say like, I, because if people from my church listen to this, it's important that they know that it was never like them that caused me to do that. I sure. think it's more like a pressure, um, 
you know, to like fit in or whatever, which now I'm realizing to fit in, I feel like it just has to be me and everyone fits in. If you're just you, you know, I think, and we don't have to stay in here long, but that's the message of Jesus is you should be you and you fit with me, you know, and he made us to be us. So it should be that simple. But. Yep. And what is curious about that to me <laughs> and says a little about Andy's wounds uh, toward the church or clear chip on his shoulder is that what, what I brought up uh, had to do with a relationship with God. Oh yeah. Yes. And uh, the church being no consideration. Sure. And, and certainly uh, that pressure shouldn't have been an aspect of it. And I wish that that wasn't the reality of becoming a Christian. Um, but I, I do still feel like, none of that time or that journey was wasted either. Oh, like you, no, you I don't, are I, yeah. where you are now by God's design. Yeah. And even, I still, I still even like the art itself that I made. Um, and I still believe in it. I do still believe in the words I wrote. And I think that's where I was at in my spirituality, you know, I was new to everything. So there was joy in those words and there was joy in, in that season. Um, I just think, where I'm at now, I wouldn't approach it in the same way. Yeah. That's all. But no, I don't, I don't have hard feelings or anything like that. I, I'm mm. I'm thankful for that. Obviously, so thankful for that season of my life. But I have learned a lot. I just feel like I've grown up a little bit and understand yeah, who totally. I am, you know. I just, and I don't, I'm not coming back against any, but like in terms of this podcast, like I'd want it to be about the creative process and stuff, which this is all, this is it, what we're mm-hmm. talking about right here. But I just feel like, I, a part of me cringes because I'm thinking about people listening to this podcast who aren't Christians, who I very much want to be a part of this. And they're just like, what, what is, what the heck are they talking about? Like, sure. that's what a weird system, which I agree with them, but isn't it silly? Sometimes I, I, I think of that, especially as someone who wasn't one for a long time, <laughs> like how silly a lot of these conversations. Well, I, just, I, to, but. I, I would put this conversation in the box of like, I would really, I don't want to stay here for very long. Like, you know. For sure, just because I think art is just valuable by itself, and it can be done inside, outside, <laughs> every right. every which way. Sure. Um, I I don't know how much time you want to do the interview, Josh, but I have a question. I have a question for okay, you, Alex. I, <laughs> I do just want to say real quick. Oh no! <laughs> I hear where you're coming from. I think it is still more. I want to explore and dig into the whole person. And I think yeah. for someone who believes in God, that is undeniably tied yeah. to right. their work. And no, like people listening, <sighs> I guess we're going to do this now. No, this this isn't a Christian show. <laughs> wow, we are doing <laughs> and yet, uh, And yet, <laughs> at least from my end, it's going to have some of that. Yeah. And so, I'm going to feel uncomfortable every time and try to avoid it. I know. Well, that's Andy and I's relationship in real life. Yep. So it's just like, for goodness sakes, if you're listening and you're not a Christian, don't get so freaked out that you have to back away. Um, we're still just people and you can think we're crazy. That's quite fine. You can think Alex and I are crazy. You can think Andy's just one of you. Wow. Okay, Andy, go ahead. <laughs> oh, geez. Well, to come back again. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. Um, Alex, we've been on tour together uh-huh. once. We have for like have once. four weeks. Dude, that was long. It was very it was long. Um, I just <laughs> I want you to think back to those times. Okay. You and me and Levi and Brandy in the van. I just tell me one of your favorite moments from the whole tour. Um man, there are countless. Uh well, it's the first one that's coming to mind because it's purely about you. And I think it's because it's, a, I'm staring at you right now uh-huh. and I can't get the other thoughts out of my brain. <laughs> so we, we were playing a concert and we pull up to our venue and it's at a church. We played at a lot of churches. Um, that's all I'll say about that for Andy's sake. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we don't talk about church too long. Uh-huh. Um, so anyway, we played at a lot of churches. Those happen to be our venues on this tour. And 
uh, so Levi did a Kickstarter. Oh no! Le- Levi did a Kickstarter for his album, and one of the rewards was if he paid. It was one of the top tier, like biggest ones. If he paid for it, he would come to your town and do a concert for you and like your own private thing. And so Andy and I agreed to do the show for this private thing. Right. It was just and like was, we were. On, it was on the route. Right, like so we were on tour. Well it was, his thing. Yeah, it was just one night on the tour, just like any other night. It wasn't like a big deal. We were both like, yeah, it's, let's do it. That's fine. Yeah. So we get to our venue, and it's a small little church in somewhere West Virginia. Mm. I don't know the city's name. Yeah, I don't Maybe remember. Where the, wherever the college is. Um, Morgantown? Morgan? One no of those. Um, I've blocked this all out. <laughs> <laughs> so we walk into the actual room where we're going to be playing, and it's like a, you know, it's a sanctuary there there are no there's no sound system and part of our writer agreement was to have a sound system provided for us um and so we told the guy or we asked him like so where are the speakers well and and this was a weird thing because as a kickstarter people there's no like promoter there's no one who really knows sure so it's like a family on. it's like a family and like their 10 friends who are at the show <laughs> there's like 20 20 to 25 people there total but so we ask, like, oh, where are the speakers? And for context, this is midway through the tour, like dead center. We're all like, okay, yeah. we're finally at the point where we're getting annoyed at each other. We're getting tired <laughs> of this van. We're getting a little tired of whatever. And so he was like, oh, they're up there. And he points to the walls, and there are two, it's one tiny. on each side of the room. There, there may be like two, like three-inch speakers uh-huh. on the walls and he says those are and they're from like 1975 yeah. uh-huh. and he says those are the speakers and so andy <laughs> looks at me and he says i'm not playing <laughs> <laughs> and so i was like dude you're well, not- to be clear we we were running a pretty cool rig where there was in ears and we were only running through a pa <laughs> right there's right. no lot there's no like amps or drums or it's all going through a computer and into a PA. So right. that's why it was very important. <laughs> right. So Andy was like, I'm not playing. <laughs> so, um, I don't really know what ended up happening. Well, I just, do you remember when I tried to revive their old sound system? Because there was no. one in like a back closet. I that I, it was this huge, no. massive rack I rolled out. And I was like, I'm going to no. try to fix this. And I plugged it in and it just like blew up. Okay. Like smoke coming out okay i don't remember that i just remember you saying i'm not playing and you stormed out (laughs) and you were sad and upset yeah and i don't know what happened i think levi talked you into playing yeah he did and it ended up working out so that's the first memory he convinced me that no one would know how bad it sounds which didn't (laughs) really help me but at the same time you had in ears so it's yeah well that's that's true because it was gonna sound the same it did every night to me right so i just had to not think about what it would sound like in the house right so okay now i'm remembering <laughs> the actual best part of that tour uh, well okay and that was a little story about andy <laughs> but here's a story about a man in atlanta georgia oh who, who i he, forgot this i should have known this would be the best so this story. is one of the weirdest shows i've ever played uh-huh in general there i think there were nine bands on this bill uh-huh. and obviously levi andy and i played it but we were like in the middle so I think no, we were like, at the end. Were we? Okay. Yeah. So there were f- like literally five or six bands before we even started. And there was this guy who was doing poetry. Well, kinda, there was like bands, other spoken word poets and a rapper. Right. So there, yeah, exactly. But there was one guy mm-hmm. who he was doing poetry mm-hmm. and he was really doing poetry. And so <laughs> all of us were, were watching him. And just kind of, I think we were maybe up after him. I think that's why we were all in there yeah, watching. But uh-huh. at the at the end of his set, he was like kind of a, um, for lack of a better term, bro. Yeah. So he was a little bit like super buff. Uh-huh. Did not seem like he'd be doing like artsy poetry. So, but he redeemed all that. He did in just a few moments. And he at the end of the his set, he was doing a poem. I forgot all the details. He pulled out a bottle of spray paint. Uh huh. And started just. He was doing a poem and he was spraying himself, like spraying all over his plain, yeah, white his t-shirt. plain white t-shirt yeah. in black spray paint. And we were like, okay, he's being cool. He's doing his art, art uh-huh. thing or whatever. And then he, at the end of his poem, he said something and then he pulls out a lighter 
and he lights himself on fire. Yeah, all up the front of his shirt. Like he lights his shirt on fire. He the flames go <laughs> into his face. Yeah. He has flames in his face. Like covering his face. We can't see it. Okay, anymore. it's still <laughs> It's still not even over. No. The best part, he's he's like he's, on and he's fire. still saying poetry. Yeah, he's, on, he's on fire, saying his poem, and he like finishes his poem, and like the last word he says, um, like the last word, and then he does literally. I am not making this no. up. He does a backflip onto his chest on the stage. No, it's backflip into belly flop. That's into exactly belly flop what on stage that put out the fire. <laughs> And then he got up and walked off stage and everyone in the room was like mesmerized. It was unbelievable. And I, yeah, that was by far the most amazing moment of that tour. Yeah, absolutely. I have never seen someone give it their all like that. Yeah. No, that that was one of those nights where this is either going to be the worst night ever or the best night. And because of that, it turned into right. It was really close to being Uh the worst, but then that redeemed everything. Yep. So that that was the. Did you like those stories, Josh? I enjoyed those <laughs> narratives. I I have a question. Okay. I have something to ask. So I I've been trying to catch up on the shows so I could be prepared. Mm. Um, I really, and I'm not saying this to toot your horns. I do really like the show. Okay. I love Thank I love you. the show a lot. Um, I want to talk about millennials for just a few moments. <laughs> okay. More so the communication. Of You're millennials. up, Josh. Yeah, this is toward Josh. I wanted to pose when you guys were talking about emails. I wanted to scream through my headphones <laughs> about how I felt about it. Uh huh. So, Josh, you said that um, you kind of feel like emailing is on an equal playing field to talking in real life. For better or worse, yes, that's how my brain <laughs> views it. Yeah. Okay. My question, and this is this sounds so douchey and businessy. <laughs> do you feel like that scales? Like, do you feel like that scales when you start getting a lot of emails? Um, like for example, some guy who like he gets a hundred a day. That's not this. I feel like that's different. I feel like email exists. So it's like a gate into your life. Like it's kind of a wall you put up. So people can't be in your immediate life if you don't want them to be. Right. And that's what I like about it. Hmm. Is that awful of me to think that? (laughs) That's what I wanted to say the whole time. I just thought like, well, it exists. So, so you don't have to talk to everyone face to face it's like a less formal yeah no i think that's fair and i've never been one of those people who i, I have many no i have emails either. i'm more uh dying for human interaction <laughs> um but uh <laughs> i just wonder like why why I think we could embrace the the distance of it in a good way. Well, but do you do you lives. agree with my assessment where I was trying to come up with a hierarchy of like, so email is missing these amount of things yeah, from yeah yeah yeah, yeah from yeah. interpersonal communication. Like you've got to be aware of what's missing and right. Some of those of, things have strengths because yeah. certain things are missing. I feel like of course. I, I feel like there's like an I have a like an inner circle, and of people whom I would. Who respond sp- to their email. Who I spend time with. No, no, no. I respond to pretty much every email. But nice. If <laughs> um, me and Josh respond to our emails, Andy. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, I'm the asshole here. Go I ahead. might be a little tardy in mine, but I do respond to them. So I, I think I like the human aspect of my very close inner circles of people. Yeah. And then I like the technology. And then everyone it, else, you're just like, screw those guys. Kind of. Yeah, a little know. bit. Like, <laughs> like, not like screw those guys, but I definitely put like way more value on the people I spend my actual time with. And it's yeah. like text messages. Mm-hmm. Josh, you might both think I'm insane for this, but I genuinely look at text messages almost identical to an email. Yeah. I like believe in, that. in value. Yeah. Like the, it's like human interaction. And then under that is all techno 
technological yeah. talking. So I respond to texts really poorly. I'm told by many of my friends I'm the worst texter they know. Um, but I'm okay with that. I feel like it's a good distance to have. Yeah. I feel like I'm not letting Josh say his side. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. I, I'm willing to admit that my view on this is all my personal neurotic quality in my head that is broken. I think it's just because I do, um, I have felt burned by people so many times <laughs> by reaching out in a way that I think is very kind and uh, putting myself out there in a way that at least is worthy of a response mm. and getting none. And, and honestly, only very recently am I learning to just don't worry about what they think of you. Just follow up again and be like, hey, did you see this? And more times than not, it's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> right. But, you know, I do, I cannot help it that that when, if I don't get a response the first time, it's just like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> like, on, honestly, and I don't want to do that. Okay, yeah. So are you talking, I'm sorry, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this either, but I do have a little bit of pushback. <laughs> do you... So in that scenario, when you're when you're sending an email out to someone and they're not responding, do you feel like you've earned the place in their life to receive that email? Mm. Josh, your response? It has. <laughs> there, <laughs> because there to me, has dude, been. I've sent out so many embarrassing emails to like my heroes and like never gotten a response. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm Nothing just like, I like can't that. take that personal because. I don't have that place in their life to even like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. But if you're talking like personal business relationships or whatever, that's one thing, I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah. 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 There's, there's been some on all spectrums. There's been emailing very close friends and there's been uh, reaching out to people for the first time who don't know me from Adam. Um, and so I d- obviously do not get as hurt about the ones that are kind of like a cold call email, so to speak. And that is almost always related to uh, trying to, I don't know, pitch myself in some sort of way hmm. so that I can make a connection with them or network or whatever. Um, no, the ones the ones that irk me are just either acquaintances or good friends or close friends um, or the guys working on your movie <laughs> or them yeah it's um i d- i don't literally view it in as the same level as a conversation a- as in the way that okay. i think about it but i i still just feel um i like i just put so much weight into it and i am very particular and articulate and uh even long-winded in my emails and my texts because i want to be understood well Hmm. and um it's almost like you should be an author or a writer yeah (laughs) can we all can we all just admit our most embarrassing email attempts oh whose podcast is this (laughs) i just want to hear i used to ask when i was in high school i would send cold emails to really huge bands asking them to go on tour when i was in high school (laughs) i didn't have any I'm just kidding. I think I did. I just wanted to sound old. I can't think of an embarrassing one off the top of my head. Okay. (laughs) You could tell yours though. I just feel like I've sent them to countless artists who are like my heroes and like amazing. And I just sent them emails thinking like, oh my gosh, they're going to like totally take me out on tour with them (laughs) or something. And I would always just be sad, disappointed. Yeah. With their, their non-response to me. I'm sorry, Alex. <sighs> it's all right. You live and you learn how to email, you know? Yeah, so. yeah you learn a lot in those situations. Um, you feel good, Josh? I do not feel good, but I'm ready for the internet comment <laughs> portion of the show so that we can get this over. Okay.
Okay. This is the portion of the show where my wife stops listening. I was going to dedicate this to your wife <laughs> if you would have let me talk. <laughs> hey, Alex, I need your help on this, on this segment okay. here. I'm going to give you two options for comments. You got to okay. pick. I'll, I'll give you the general gist of it. Um, I'll read it, and then I want your immediate reaction. So first comment is based on uh, like genre stuff and sort of the gear thing, uh, being ambient music. Mm-hmm. Um, second one is based on someone commenting on the fact that I've joined a record label. Which one do you want to hear? Mm. <laughs> uh, man. Do you think people... Sometimes I wonder... If this... <laughs> Where is the... What are you doing? Okay, <laughs> let's do the second one. Okay. Sometimes I wonder if listeners would think we pre-planned which one I would pick. No. Okay. No. The second one. We okay. Uh all right. So uh <laughs> Josh. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, first off, this is in all caps. You should know that. All right. Andy, I love your music so much, but did you really need to join a record company? I hope and pray to God you haven't sold your soul for money, mate, because your life will be miserable. <laughs> <laughs> what? Andy, I really feel like that's God's voice talking no. to you. <laughs> Alex, your thoughts. I'm just being a schnur. <laughs> <laughs> You're just mad now. It's okay, we'll talk after the show. <laughs> no. Uh to me it sounds like a a good fan who likes what you do and they don't want you to to become lame. It sounds like a... a, a how, how would you take this? I would take it as, man, I have fans who comment on my videos and say... Are you being for real? I am. Okay. I would, I would immediately, You're so nice. I would immediately think, dang, this person like likes what I do enough to think like I don't want them to sell out and I don't want them to start doing stuff that sucks. See, and it, a lot of times when people go to labels, and I don't know what how much detail about your label thing there is out, but... They don't know what label, right? No. So they don't know that it's like a cool agreement thing and all that stuff. So all they know is that there's a label and that could jeopardize Well, and that's, their... that's what this stuff gets uh, at is that the, and I've said this before, just the assumptions people make mm. are just like, that's the, the I, 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 I wish I could be as nice as you and see that and be like, oh, that's so great. I've got a fan who cares. But I see that, I see that as a fan who has rules about who i can be dude what (laughs) no it's just a guy who likes your stuff it's a guy who likes you and doesn't want you why is he in all caps but it yeah it's really that's a passive aggressive way to put it for for him i mean for the guy of of of, yeah because there's like this warning in it that's like i like what you do but you better not be taking money for it exactly Uh, yeah yeah and i love that you that's not what you picked up on first in my <laughs> yeah. cynical ass. Immediately, like, I just thought like, <gasps> dang, there's this dude who really digs your stuff and wants you to keep making cool stuff and not succumb yeah, He to wants the... me to make it the way he wants it, though, and that's the problem. Yeah, well. Are you as cynical as me yet? We'll get you there. No, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I'm even close. Oh, we should meet up once a week. <laughs> They'll teach you. Are you getting right, there, let's, Josh? Let's hear, the, let's hear the second one. Oh, oh, you want to yeah, do them I'm both? Cynical. I oh. thought we were going to hear them oh, both. I, I just wanted to go with... Let's hear another. That was short. Speed <laughs> round. Well, okay. This is a longer comment, so you might be shooting yourself in the foot here. Mm. Okay. So, okay. this I'm trying to think how to say this. So he starts off saying, 1980s guitar student main questions, dot, dot, dot. What are modes? How do you sweep arpeggios? How did they do that whammy bar trick? And then second part, 2016 guitar questions, dot, dot, dot. What gear do I need to play one note and let it get morphed into minutes of music? How can I get gear to play more notes than I do? Third third part, hey, I enjoy ambient as much as anyone, but it is interesting to see how guitar has moved from Ingve to the edge. (laughs) What? What, Alex? What is this guy? It's just funny to me. (laughs) Which part of it is funny? I don't know, Josh. <laughs> you, you talk. I'm just laughing. Um, yeah, people are strange. I I feel like he's trying to be clever and funny, um, 
But why is it that most YouTube comments sound passive aggressive? Well, well cause the I mean, because they are. System or, the, or they're just straight up aggressive. It validates passive aggressive people. Because it, I, through all of that, it seems like he's being a little bit insulting and yet actually asking a question too. But yeah, call it like calling your music one note that just repeats and morphs because of the gear that you have. Well, actu- pretty... actually, the, the, when I read it a second time, it wasn't as like offensive or jarring as i first read it because he's just what it seems like he's doing is which is it's unfair he he looked at 1980s music was like here's some really subjective or object subjectively good things in 1980s music that he pulled out and then he pulled out some subjectively bad things from 2016 music i was like that's not fair there's plenty of bullshit going on in the 80s that we could compare and be like yeah that that was really bad too right josh you love the 80s there was some bad stuff in there i'm aware of the 80s and it is equally good and bad (laughs) (laughs) no i just i the more i read it the more i agree with him but in the sense that he's not saying anything what 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 are you thinking over there alex little giggle bug on the couch i know (laughs) i'm so not thinking about that comment what i'm i think uh i don't i don't know (laughs) Are you worried if Fandy and I's relationship is going to be okay after this? <laughs> no, I feel bad. I don't want to. I just. Oh. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to be. Uh, should we sing Kumbaya? I should load should. that sample. We up. Should. Why do you? Why do you feel bad? I don't want to backtrack, but I. I don't. I hope I didn't come off like a dick about the internet comment or the not internet the millennials. Comments, the millennials. No, you didn't. <laughs> okay, hey, believe me. After we stop recording every episode. I say a lot of cuss words and I'm like, we shouldn't put this out. And then I say, <laughs> okay. boy, because I sounded I f- like a dick, didn't I? Right? Don't I say and that? And they're Josh? like, well, I guess we'll go ahead and upload it. <laughs> no, Andy's just like, <laughs> okay. that was me shooting off my fire guns. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. I, I felt I just want to be a good guest. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a hijacker. Well, I mean, you could blame and, us. Yeah. I could. As bad hosts. Could. you have an out totally so i did I, my favorite part of that comment though to bring it to circle back okay, circle back was that he referred to ambient as just a ambient. genre yeah that yeah. was the thing that got me and then he mentioned ingve ingve <laughs> right yeah again uh, as in previous weeks he did give away his age a little bit he's he's got to be at least my age or older to say ingve in Yng- the edge. ingve in the edge like and also the fact that he thinks the edge is I don't see the way he plays guitar is no way related to the way I play guitar. So we always have trouble knowing how to close <laughs> the episode. Yeah. So do you? <laughs> does it always end with a with a internet comment? Yeah, that's yeah. We've got a strict formula here that we're adhering to. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I kind of want to know. I want to know what's going on with Josh. Wait. I wish you were well, in this room with us that's so a, bad. That's been our show, and I uh, <laughs> hope we all had a great time, and uh, we'll be back next week with more hijinks and uh, can, fantastic can uh, you... scenarios. And, uh... <laughs> Alex, you'll just have to listen to next week when we uh, both apologize at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I really was hoping for at least one moment of McConaughey, Josh. Oh, that's all I want. give it to him, buddy. He He's asking. Well, Alex see next week we're just gonna apologize for all this we're just gonna be like <laughs> get that out of here we didn't mean nothing we publicly apologize and it's just like hey guys this this will be the good one this will be my the keeper take that's just like smooth i'm not ready for the end. <laughs> Josh, alone, at the mic.